Welcome to the very first episode of God, Tarot, and the Scriptures. I'm making a series of videos for you to play before you go to sleep, or perhaps to help put you to sleep. Please remember that these ideas are just suggestions. These ideas are what I firmly believe, but I am always tolerant and open and interested in other people's beliefs and suggestions. We all have a piece of the truth. In case you have your eyes closed, I'm going to describe the card that I have on the screen right now. It is an ace. It is the ace of pentacles. Pentacles in tarot represent matter, something. It represents something that actually exists. Often it represents money, um, but usually it's something tangible. And what does that mean? Something that you can hold in your hand. It's an actual thing. And in tarot, we often speak of the word manifest. So what does that mean? It means something that has come into physical existence. Our five senses shows us it exists. So imagine, for example, if you were listening to some of these manifest money quickly subliminals and you're listening to a particular subliminal that tells you that unexpected money is coming your way and you might think to yourself well that's crazy i am not expecting any money imagine that you allowed yourself to fall asleep to that subliminal and you woke up the next day checked your bank account and there was a rebate for something that you remember oh right they had to refund me because they didn't have any you know cat food that i ordered so they said that in a few days it would be refunded it would be rebated so it's kind of like that it's unexpected it's the you know the appearance of something that's real something that you can touch like a quarter, a pentacle, a rock. It's something that you can physically see here in this 3D. You can touch it. It has weight. So let's just call things in the 3D matter. And what do I mean by matter? What I mean is it's energy that requires space. So it's energy that takes up space. So, for example, we know that we can't take a rock and another rock and have them occupy the same space. I can't walk through your body. We can't occupy the same space. Because one of the limitations of this three-dimensional existence that we're living in, the world... The world is the 3D, this actual earth world. And everything that our eyes can perceive is the world, is matter. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that you could think of that cloud as the heavens, as heaven. Now, a lot of people have trouble imagining that heaven exists because we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't taste it. We can't touch it. Our five senses are not equipped to detect heaven. I'm going to suggest to you that you replace the word heaven with something that we do know exists and we, we do know, for example, that the quantum field exists because physicists are able to study the quantum field with the use of particle accelerators. You don't need to know what, what that is, but you can be assured that hardcore science, people who are not spiritual and don't believe in God, they, they 
if there are, are physicists, they will tell you that the quantum field absolutely does exist. Now, how is the quantum field the same as heaven? We can't see it. Or, as humans, we can't see it. We can't feel it. We can't taste it. We can't touch it. It's exactly like heaven. Also, the rule of energy requires space. Energy needs to take up space. In other words, one rock cannot occupy the same space as another rock. I can't walk through your body because the matter that we're made of, the it requires a finite amount of space. Well, that rule does not apply in the quantum field. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? In the quantum field, energy is not matter. And what does that mean? It means that energy is there, but it's not occupying space. They are probability amplitudes, not particles. Now, I want you to imagine if you and I were sitting in a room together and there was a seed that was planted in, some, in a pot of earth on a table that we're watching. Imagine if we were to videotape that, that, that pot of earth and imagine that the video after the seed has sprouted into a plant and after the plant has sprouted into a fairly good size orange tree that is taking up half the room, imagine if we were to speed up the video of that plant growing, if we were to simply put it in high speed. Well, what we would see is something coming from nothing. Now, I recognize that there's a seed there, but the enormous plant that that eventually grows from that tiny seed, that is taking up so much space, it is impossible for it to have come from the seed. In other words, it's almost like if we were to speed up the tape, it would almost be like a magic trick. Where did that come from? It's like the magician pulling a rabbit out of a hat. How did that giant rabbit fit in that hat? Well, how did that giant plant suddenly appear? We did have to speed up the tape, of course, but you would have to agree with me that it's not a magic trick. The plant did grow. We simply sped up the tape. Now, what does this prove? Here's what it proves. You and I are living in a three-dimensional existence where energy requires space. So where the heck did that giant plant come from? It suddenly appeared if you speed up the tape. Boom. Physicists will tell you it came from the quantum field. Everything in this world, everything, originates from the quantum field. That's where you and I came from. A thousand years ago, where was your body? Let's speed up the tape. Boom. Suddenly, we have something that, you know, something that came from nothing. And yes, it's quite accurate to call heaven nothing because it is no thing. A thing is matter. It's, you know, it is the manifestation of, of energy from the quantum field. And so, in other words, if something means a rock, something, some piece of matter, something that has manifested in this three-dimensional world, well, nothing means no matter. 
That is the quantum field. Now, now let me suggest that this is in the scriptures. I'm looking at the Gospel of John. Now remember, I want you to replace the word heaven with the quantum field. John said, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. What John was saying is that everything comes from heaven. Everything comes from the quantum field. Everything. And that is why you can be reassured that you cannot lose, um, you know, the loss of money or the destruction of a physical thing. There, there is no need to fear loss of things because everything comes from the quantum field, from heaven. Again, a man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. In other words, everything, every piece of matter comes from the quantum field, comes from heaven. Chapter 1 of the Gospel according to St. John begins with this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Do you notice the number of times that the word light, L-I-G-H-T, is used? We are going to come back to this word light in a few moments. Just keep that word light in the back of your mind for now. All of the physical things that surround you, a table, a chair, rock, all physical things vibrate at a certain frequency. For example, wood vibrates at a certain frequency, metal vibrates at another frequency. <clears throat> but all matter, things, physical things, they vibrate at lower frequencies. So for example, if you're if you have your eyes closed, what I have here is a piece of paper. And on the left side, going up, if you go from the left to the right, the frequency increases. And we're looking at how does energy behave um, at, at lower vibrations compared to these higher vibrations. Well, first of all, all vibrations, all energy that vibrates up to the speed of light, so we could call that lower vibrational energy, that's where matter occurs. That's where energy um, becomes a particle. So at vibrations up to the speed of light, energy exists as a particle. And what does that mean? Energy needs space, so it becomes a thing. And physicists, when they look at how the vibration um, behaves, um, it, it, you can see there that there's sort of a wavy energy um, for energy that, any energy that is existing at less than the speed of light. 
It's called wavy energy. It's also called finite wavy energy. In other words, finite in the sense that it needs a certain amount of space, a specific amount of space. Infinite means that no space is required. You'll notice that in the 3D, in lower vibrations, time is relevant. In the quantum field, time is not relevant. Now, as you move along that page from the left to the right, that line that I have down the middle of the page, that is the speed of light. So everything to the right of that uh, is how energy behaves from the speed of light up to, you know, the highest vibration. That is the quantum field. The right side of the page is heaven. It's the quantum field where time is not relevant and space is not relevant. Something interesting happens to energy waves um, when you go beyond the speed of light. It starts looping into what's called a lamnescape or the infinity sign. And it becomes infinite waveless energy. And what I mean by that is even sound um, behaves as wavy energy. In other words, it bounces off things. It cannot permeate things. So it behaves rather like a particle, even though it's a vibration, because it is energy in the 3D lower than the speed of light. Why can't we see with our eyes into the, why can't we see the quantum field? Why can't we taste it, feel it, smell it? Well, there's a very simple explanation for that. All of our five senses as human beings are not equipped to detect anything that operates faster than the speed of light. So our five senses, our ability to see, to hear, to taste, to smell, to touch, they are only capable of assisting us in detecting energy that vibrates at vibrations that are slower than the speed of light. We do know from hardcore science that cats and snakes have the ability to sense energy from the quantum field. Um, it, so it, scientists believe that it actually is in a portion of their brain behind their eyes. That's why they call it the third eye or the cat's eye. A cat is able to detect thoughts, the energy of thought. A cat can pick up on energy that is operating in the quantum field. Here we have the ace of cups. It is unconditional love. The five streams of water represent our five senses. In other words, we have a sixth sense. We have the ability to detect unconditional love, but not through the use of any of the five senses. They often call this card um, love that is that is felt without words, so you nobody has said it. Um, this is how the woman in the strength card earns the trust of the lion. This is why the lion doesn't devour her. This is why she is able to earn uh, the trust of animals, and animals will acquiesce to her because she communicates with them telepathically. She communicates unconditional love using a portion of her brain that is not being used by most people in today's society. Let's call it the sixth sense. It's the portion of the brain that is active when you're meditating, journaling, 
you know, when you're doing anything, any form of um, expansion, any form of being close to God. And let me tell you something interesting. Using that side of the brain doesn't mean that you have to be sitting down doing transcendental meditation. It is, um, it is a frequency of peace. We do know, for example, that women who knit, women who uh, they go into an incredible state. It's, it's a very high vibrational state. Um, it's, it is a very um, beautiful form of meditation, deep meditation, peace of mind. It's also the same part of the brain that psychics use. It's a completely different wavelength. The woman in the strength card is also said to have a telepathic connection with the lion. She is unconditionally loving toward that animal, and the animal can pick up on this. The lamnescape above her head, or the infinity sign, in this card also refers to emotional intellect. Where does that come from? God. Now let's go back to the Ace of Cups and what the scriptures say about the material world. Now the five streams are the five senses which allow us to enjoy the material world and the purpose of material things. Spirit, God, and the, that intelligent, loving, divine energy from heaven, from the quantum field, wants us to enjoy this 3D experience. So let's go back to the Ace of Pentacles before we start. Clearly, this card supports the idea of all things, because that is a thing, a pentacle, come from the heavens, come from the quantum field. It's a gift from God. In the Ace of Cups, we have spirituality being imported here into this cup, and out of the cup are the five streams of water. Those five streams of water are our five senses, our ability to experience the material world, the material gift. But notice how the, sorry, the key part of this card is the unconditional love. It comes along with the five senses and the, it, there is an idea of what is essential about it is the spiritual element. And this is reflected as well in the scriptures. The inherent value of physical things, of material things, according to spirit, according to God, the purpose, the, the way that we are supposed to um, interact with physical things, the way that God wants us to experience this, is to be happy, to enjoy the taste of something, to enjoy interacting with something, to um, it's not to hoard and save up our money. It's to spend. It's to interact. It's to enjoy things because we are, the value in these things is the enjoyment of it. Now, let me explain a little further. The only way that I can explain this, there is one scripture and one example that I want to use. So the story of the littlest angel is an excellent example. So there was a little boy who died when he was about four years old. And he's residing in heaven with the archangels, and he's very young, and he stutters, and he's constantly knocking things over, and um, he can't sing in tune, and, you know, it, he's causing quite a ruckus, and he's very homesick. I'm just going to um, read a quote here, all right? Now, the idea here 
is this is a an example of how and why we are to enjoy material things. So the littlest angel um, was very homesick. Oh, not that paradise wasn't beautiful, but earth was beautiful too. Wasn't it created by God himself? Why, there were trees to climb and brooks to fish and caves to play pirate chief in, the swimming hole and the sun and rain and dark and dawn and thick brown dust so soft and warm beneath your feet. So he's now talking to one of the archangels. The understanding angel smiled, and in his eyes shone the memory of another small boy from long ago. Then he asked the littlest angel what would make him most happy in paradise. The cherub thought for a moment and whispered in his ear, There's a box. I left it under my bed back home. If only I could have that. The understanding angel nodded his head. You shall have it, he promised. And a fleet-winged heavenly messenger was instantly dispatched to bring the box to paradise. And then, in all those timeless days that followed, everyone wondered at the great change in the littlest angel. For among all the cherubs in God's kingdom, he was the most happy. His conduct and appearance were all that any angel could wish for. And it could be said, and truly said, that he flew like an angel. So now because he has his box of things, you know, he's uh, everything, he's happy. And then in all those, sorry, then it came to pass that Jesus, the Son of God, was to be born. And as a glorious tiding spread throughout paradise, all the angels rejoiced and their voices were lifted to herald the miracle of miracles, the coming of the Christ child. The angels and archangels, the gatekeeper, the wing maker, um, yes, and even the halo smith put aside their usual tasks to prepare the gifts for the blessed infant, all but the littlest angel. He sat himself down in the topmost step of the golden stairs and anxiously waited for inspiration. What could he give that would be the most acceptable to the Son of God? At one time, he dreamed of composing a hymn of adoration, but the littlest angel was lacking in musical talent. Then he grew excited over writing a prayer, a prayer that would live forever in the hearts of men because it would be the first prayer ever to be heard by the Christ child. But the littlest angel was too small to read or write. What, oh, what could a small angel give that would please the holy infant? The time of the miracle was very close at hand when the littlest angel at last decided on his gift. Then on the day of days, he proudly brought it from its hiding place behind a cloud and humbly placed it before the throne of God. It was only a small, rough, unsightly box. So as you can see, he's decided to give away his box. But inside were all those wonderful things that even a child of God would treasure. A small, rough, unsightly box lying among all those other glorious gifts from the angels of paradise, gifts of such radiant splendor and beauty that heaven and all the universe were lighted by their glory. And when the littlest angel saw this, he suddenly wished he might reclaim his shabby gift. It was ugly. It was worthless. If only he could hide it away from the sight of God before it was even noticed. But it was too late. The hand of God moved slowly over all that bright array of shining gifts and then paused, then dropped, then came to rest on the lowly gift of the littlest angel. The littlest angel trembled as the box was opened, and there, before the eyes of God and all his heavenly host, was what he offered to the Christ child, and what was his gift to the pleasant infant? Well, there was a butterfly with golden wings, captured one bright summer day on the hills above Jerusalem, and a sky-blue egg from a bird's nest in the olive tree that stood to shade his mother's kitchen door. Yes, and two white stones, 
found on a muddy river bank where he and his friends had played like small brown beavers. And at the bottom of the box, a limp tooth marked leather strap. Sorry, I'm choking up here. Once worn as a collar by his mongrel dog who had died as he had lived in absolute love and infinite devotion. The littlest angel wept. Why had he ever thought the box was so wonderful? Why had he dreamed that such utterly useless things would be loved by the blessed infant? He turned to run and hide, but he stumbled and fell, and with a cry and clatter of halo, rolled in a ball to the very foot of the heavenly throne. There was an ominous silence in the celestial city, a silence complete and undisturbed, save for the sobbing of the littlest angel. Then, suddenly, the voice of God, like divine music, rose and swelled through paradise, and the voice of God spoke, saying, Of all the gifts of all the angels, I find that this small box pleased me most. Its contents are of the earth and of men, and my son is born to be king of both. These are the things my son, too, will know and love and cherish, and then, regretful, will leave behind him. When his task is done, I accept this gift in the name of the child, Jesus, born of Mary this night in Bethlehem. And then it goes on, you know, about the glowing light. Here is the point. The value of material things, material things only are only valuable because of love. Because of the unconditional love he had for his dog, that's why he valued the collar. Because of the, how much he loved fishing with his friends, that's why he valued the stones. Because of the memory of his mother, that's why he valued the, the robin's blue egg. Now let's look back at this card. The gifts, this unconditional love, this the, the five senses here, those five streams of water. We are supposed to detect unconditional love. We above all else. And not only that, but the gift of the five senses was so that we could enjoy the material things. So that we could love all things material for the inherent value. Without unconditional love, a material object has no value. If there's a label on something, if there's no love there, it's worthless. It doesn't matter if it cost $2,000. If there isn't unconditional love attached to that item, it has no value. It has no value. In Ecclesiastes, there are some very important truths about this material world. The very strong message is that these things are temporary, and that is why the reason why they're here are so we can ourselves be happy. We can enjoy a meal in the present moment. Um, th things are to be fully, you know, experienced with the heart. There is nothing better for a man than he should eat and drink and that he should make his soul enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw, that it was from the hand of God. There, the point is made over and over that what profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? And what, what profit is there under the sun? There is no profit under the sun. Now let me explain what that means. Under the sun means something that is done in the 3D, all right? Um, 
in Ecclesiastes, it is said over and over, there is nothing new. Nothing new can be created. All of the, um, everything that you can imagine, it has already been. There and and these are you know these are in the Kashic records. Every stanza that you know in in one of Chopin's preludes, every inspirational song, it's already been. It's already been. There, man doesn't create anything. It, we think that we're creating things. Creation happens in the quantum field. So we don't, we're not supposed to be concerned with the design. We're not supposed to go around saying we're brilliant. Look at these vaccines that we've created. Let's figure out how to get a nose job, how to straighten out something because, you know, we think it's crooked. The way it's like saying that the original true essence, the design, the mastery of how the immune system works, the the fact that a, a pregnant woman can be sitting at a piano playing, you know, an, an incredibly, you know, difficult piece, and at the same time, she's creating a baby. That is God. She's drawing from the quantum field. The music, everything, everything under the sun has already been. And we did not create it. So yes, we can go to work and, you know, we can do arts and crafts and paint. But everything that's being done here has already been done. It's already been done. What's my point? My point is, the whole purpose of being here is not to show off and become wise and create all these degrees and preach, you know, or or to... um, you know, save up a lot of money so you can leave a legacy or to hoard things so you can show off about how much money you have or to suffer because you, you know, you want to uh, provide to suffering because, you know, you, you want to leave your children with money. Then you're defiling the whole purpose of being here. The purpose of being here is to, to, Feel this with your heart. These are gifts from God. The things, these are material things. They are, they are to be enjoyed. They are consumable. They are temporary. They, they are, they have no value. So God is saying you are here to experience the material things. Enjoy them. They're, they are not important. They come and they go. The thing that hath been is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. In other words, all the source of creation, it doesn't happen here. We draw upon the, where is the, where are the creative ideas? They're in the quantum field. And, and we are drawing upon the source, you know, of, of, of a very, very intelligent design. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new. It hath been already of old time, which was before us. There is no remembrance of former things, neither shall there be any remembrance of things to come, that are to come with those that shall come after. In other words, live in the present moment. For there is a man whose labor is in wisdom and in knowledge, in other words, somebody getting a bunch of degrees, and in equity, yet to a man that hath not labored therein shall he leave it for his portion. This is also vanity. In chapter 11 of Ecclesiastes, there is a repeated message that there is no profit under the sun. And in chapter 3, we hear the famous to every thing, in other words, every material thing, there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. 
a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. And it goes on and on. What profit, profit, hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in all his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. All right, so now for the big grand finale about the light. How is it that things can come into the 3D from the quantum field? How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, here's how it happens. Photons. Photons. You know what that is? Light. And here is the incredible thing. What physicists have discovered about how things come from the quantum field from heaven into the 3D is it's the collision of photons. These are ions that are accelerated to the speed of light. They brush past each other and they produce electrons, which are actual matter, and positrons. Now, there's something that's really interesting, and, and physicists actually don't understand. Positrons are like, it's, it's antimatter, but it's like a living ghost of the electrons for every... So, in other words, this collision of light, when, and the photons are sped up to the speed of light, when they, they brush by each other, it's, it's co literally collisions of light. They create two particles. So um, what's also happening is that, um, it, you know, from, from as, you know, as, as with the plant on the table, um, we're getting from one, you know, from nothing, we're getting more than it, it seems to be. It's an impossibility in, in, in this 3D, but that's how things come from the unmanifest to the manifest. Now, here is something really incredibly interesting. So, we do know that everything that exists beyond this, higher than the speed of light, is in a is not in particle form. It acts like a, well, it's waveless energy. So you know it, it is it is still a wave. It's not a particle. We also know that energy below the speed of light um, appears as a particle, appears as matter. Matter, but the photons, the collisions of light that bring things into creation, act like a wave and a particle. They have the, um, the, the characteristics of both a wave and a particle. And there is a, there, if you look at the, uh, um, at the studies that physicists are doing, there has been a long-standing debate over how the heck they work. Electrons... And there is the mirror image positron, the antimatter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, 
and without him there was not anything made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Thank you so much for listening. Let me know if you have any comments or any thoughts. Okay, bye. We'll see you tomorrow night.